you know, over the last couple of hundred years, scientists have been discovering more and more about that thing that we call reality. Going back a hundred years, around about the 20th century beginning, I think most people thought at that time that really we knew all that we were going to know about reality. And then some scientists were doing some experiments, doing some experiments with light, with lasers. And they noticed something. Is light a wave? Or is light a particle? Hmm. Let me explain. This is all about something called a two-slit experiment. And you may well have done a two-slit experiment in physics at school. If you shine a laser at a piece of card, say, with two very narrow slits in the piece of card, what you'll see is that light is a wave. You'll see direct evidence that light is in fact a wave. What you'll see as the laser beams at the card and the light goes through the slits, what you'll see is an image on the back wall which consists of light and dark bands, just like this. And the explanation for this pattern relies on the basic features of waves. It's easiest for you to think about waves in terms of water. So, imagine a large, still lake. If you drop a pebble in the lake, then obviously it will create water waves. If you simultaneously drop two pebbles into the lake, then each of them will produce these water waves. And the waves, in the waves, there'll be areas where the water's lower than usual and areas where the water's higher than usual. That's the wave, isn't it? So the highest part of the wave's called the peak and the lowest is called its trough. So you drop two pebbles into the lake and the waves head off towards each other. And when they cross, you get what's called interference. When a peak of one wave and the peak of the other cross over, the height of the water is even greater. As, of course, it's two peaks added together. Likewise, when a trough of one wave meets the trough of another the depression in the water is even deeper. Two depressions put together, of course. And then the other thing is when a peak of one wave crosses the trough of another, then what you'll find is they'll actually cancel each other out. They'll cancel each other out as the peak tries to make the water go up while the trough tries to drag it down. And it's the same principle that explains the pattern of light that forms when it passes through the two slits. The light splits into two waves that head towards the screen. And just like those two water waves, the two light waves interfere with each other. When they hit the various points on the screen, sometimes both waves are at the peak, making the screen bright. And sometimes both waves are at their troughs, also making it bright. But sometimes one wave's at its peak and the other's at its trough and they cancel. 
and that makes the dark point on the screen. So the bright and the dark bands on this screen are a telltale sign that light is a wave. It proves it. So you get these interference patterns with any kind of wave that you could imagine, really, with light waves, with sound waves, with water waves. You get this interference pattern. And then... In 1927, Davison and Germer put the cat amongst the pigeons, so to speak, because they did an experiment where it was the equivalent of firing a beam of electrons at a barrier with two slits. And as these electrons travelled onwards towards the screen they noticed their impact, and their impact was recorded by a tiny flash, which is the same sort of flashes that you get for that make up the picture on an old TV screen. And the results that they got were amazing, really. Because if you think of electrons like little bullets or little pellets, what you'd actually expect is that their impact positions would line up with the two slits. But that's not what these guys found. What actually happened was that the impact positions of the electrons actually filled out an interference pattern characteristic of waves like this. So this beam of electrons must be some kind of wave, mustn't it? Well, maybe. The thing is that if you slow the gun down and we tune it so that, let's say, it fires only one electron every, say, 10 seconds, then we can observe where these electrons hit the screen. And again, the puzzling thing is that you'd think that it would end up anywhere on the screen but it doesn't it will only land in a position where one of the bright bars would be so light's a particle then isn't it it actually seems that light's got the opportunity to behave in any way really that we observe it if we observe it as a wave it behaves as a wave if we observe it as a particle, then it'll behave as a particle. So we can actually follow the electron all the way to the slits. But as it passes through the slits, we've then really got no specific idea where it's going to end up. Other than we know it's going to end up on one of the light bands one of the positions of the light bands other than that we don't really know where it's going to end up but what we can do is we can assess the probability the probability of where it may land because it's more likely to land on one of the centre bars than it is on one of the bars that are further from the centre. In fact, the further away from the centre that you get, the lower the probability is that the electron's going to land there. And this is what we call a probability wave. All of this really bothered Einstein. The fact that the way that we observe the experiment actually changed our interpretation of the reality there, observing it as a wave or observing it as a particle. And Einstein was bothered because if the observation of one of us can change how the universe behaves 
then what about all of our observations going back millions of years into history? Time doesn't exist from a quantum physics point of view. The past, the future and the present are all happening now, happening simultaneously. Because what does it mean if you can change what you observe just by observing it? Newtonian physics, the old way of thinking, says that we don't change that which we observe. That the observer is separate from the thing that he or she observes. So that the observed is never affected by the observer. Quantum physics changes all of that thinking. In quantum physics, they say that we always interact with what we observe. So, how does that relate to human behaviour? Well, do you think that observation of a person's behaviour changes that person's behaviour. Hmm. (laughs) Think about a big anti-capitalist demonstration, let's say in London, where there are no police and no journalists around, nice and peaceful. All of a sudden, journalists turn up and observe the demonstration Do you think that that's going to change the way that the demonstrators behave? Hmm. There's really no such thing as objectivity. Any outside involvement at all is going to change the interaction between people. How does that relate then to the act of observing and re-observing past memories for a client, let's say, that presents you with a problem and that client re-examines and dwells on that memory with the problem. In fact, the psychobiologist Ernest Rossi said that any observation of a memory will change that memory forever. That's a quantum physics statement. How possibly can light behave as a photon and behave as a wave at the same time? How can that happen? 